Okay. I think also if you talk about railroads with your students, of course we have mountains of source material. The DBQ opportunities for railroad history are legion. And they range from across the entire litany of sources, textual and visual both. So, you know, simple source analysis or the tool I use in the collegiate classrooms that I learned in the history project is get yourself a half dozen primary sources, visual and textual both, mix them up, give them to the students and say establish chronology. What a great tool. Establish the order of these things. The Pacific Railroad Acts, photographs of railroad construction, le letters home from workers, federal investigation of graft and corruption, Knob Hill mansions of the railroad elites, built when, etc. That kind of just familiarity and felicity or facility with sources and chronology, powerful lesson. Teaching about railroads in California history is really tactile. Students, you know, you're going to have students across the grade levels who are railroad buffs. So the rolling stock of railroads is going to be attractive to a certain set of students. The kind of tactility of these monstrous technological inventions or innovations is going to be attractive to students, draws them in. And it's one thing, you know, we live in a world where everyone in this room has technology, sophisticated technologies on their bodies right now of varying kinds. And we live in a world, in our outdoor world, with varying kinds of very sophisticated technology on the ground, in the air, under the water, etc. The railroad was it. You know, steamships, yes, telegraph, yes. But on the landscape, the motive intrusion of the railroad is something really powerful. So talking to students about railroads, if you do the nostalgic cutting edge thing, you've brought them into, wow, that's interesting. I never knew that. Why is that? But also, if you twist and turn the railroad triumphalism of, let's say, California into some other vantage, you, you've got a hook there. And what I mean by that is, think of the textbook recitations. The rail, again, transcontinental mostly. The railroad was a product of the Civil War and the Pacific Railroad Acts, and it got built by legions of, take your pick, Irish laborers building one direction, Chinese laborers building the other direction, uh, run by a, a group of ruthless business people who made a lot of money and pulled it off, and they uh, na uh, hammered in that golden spike in 1869, and the railroad age was uh, triumphal. That, you know, nothing holds water that, no, nothing's that triumphal. It's much more interesting to peel that back. So for instance, one vantage point on student response to this is, was it opposed? Were there people against it? And why would you be against it? And the answers are legion in terms of reasons. The fundamental nature of the technology, railroads changed forever people's perception of landscape. Here's your environmental, one of your environmental triggers. Railroads are introduced into the American psyche, into the American way of life, in roughly the, the end of the first third of the 19th century. Not unfamiliar to you, I suspect. And they move from um, essentially gravity-powered motive power, push a, think of a, a mining cart on a fixed track, push a mining cart up a hill, up these stairs, push it up there, charge people a penny to sit in it, let it go. Rolls down here, comes down here, and stops. Parlor, amusement, roller coastery kind of thing. Doesn't take long for some enterprising people to say, actually, if we, put, if we pushed it or pulled it with some kind of motive power, horse, mule, oxen, we could charge two pennies and take them, and we wouldn't necessarily have to use gravity. We could take them from there two blocks away. Or we could put corn in it or grain, you know, the usual kind of accretion of purpose. Well, that intrusion on the landscape's relatively minor. It's different. It's unusual. People like Emerson and Thoreau and all the great minds of the day start writing about it. 
you know, pull up a Thorovian diary entry about railroads for your students. Why is this guy thinking about railroads? Because they're starting to web out across the country, slowly. Once you attach some engine power to it, beyond animal motive power or human motive power, there you get this new, basically reconstituted laws of nature for 19th century Americans. What do I mean by that? They go so fast. You put an engine on it, it can go 18 miles an hour, which if you're riding it in 1842 outside of Boston from point A to point B, what's your, what do you describe the journey as? What are you doing when you're on it? There's one word they use all the time. Lightning. What? Lightning. Lightning comes up, but there's another word, the, the experience. They are flying. 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 Now, they know they're not off the ground, but it's the closest thing to flying they know. And they're both tremendously titillated by it and terrified by it. And it's important to remind students of this. 18 miles an hour. This is why it's called an iron horse. It's not a horse, but that's the closest thing. They know horses can move in bursts of speed across the landscape. This is the closest thing they have to that. But of course, that creates a real problem when the mind considers that an iron horse, and a horse moves from there to here in this period of time, but a railroad, motor, railroad being driven by an engine moves much, much quicker. Ergo, bodily injury and death, a lot, till they accommodate to railroads in their lives. Think they're flying, changes the laws of physics for these people. In other words, I, what they'll say again and again and again is it's a revolution in time and distance. And it is. You can now consider, remember, this is a pedestrian culture. These are people, these are farming people. They live, they're born, live, and die within a 20-mile radius their entire life. You know, they'll leap across the country to the gold rush, yes. But by and large, this is a pedestrian, over-the-next-rise culture. The railroad revolutionizes that. I can go from here to there in a day instead of 12 days. And I can do it at 18 miles an hour. And then they do this fascinating thing, which is in the early days of railroading, they say, no women allowed. Can't ride it. Why? Why? What's that? Not safe, Not safe for what? Because. Their uteruses will fall out. <laughs> that's, the expe that's the expectation. It will fundamentally violate the reproductive system of women. Do not ride it. They get over that. But there's, it takes them a little while. What a wonderful opportunity to teach students about gender, science, physiology, culture. Okay. All right. As those railroads begin to build out and get accommodated into the culture, of course they're going to start thinking about the far west. There's your opportunity to say to, about California. California enters the national consciousness well before the gold rush because you've got early railroad visionaries with fantastic, pretty much uh, wacky, at least early on, visions that we can go all the way across the nation. But that idea, that's as old as the Enlightenment. That's the Northwest Passage for them. That's the vision, that's, almost, that's a Jeffersonian vision that there's some way we can get across the body of the continent and link Atlantic to Pacific. They thought it was a waterway. Lewis and Clark disabused Jefferson of that idea. We could build it. We can build a railroad across. Then you've got the natural challenge of nature and engineering. How do you get over the mountains? Which is, you know, many a student will be fascinated by that. By and large, you do you either go straight through them or you do a serpentine, you know, corkscrew. That's basically, 19th century engineering gets rebuilt by the railroad challenges of landscape. So the vision that you can go all the way across to California is one that's promulgated in the earlier part of the 19th century. And then, lo and behold, with fairly rapid movements across the decades, 1840s, 1850s, Civil War, it becomes, if not a reality, at least a vision where engineering money, talent, and the brawn 
of a largely immigrant workforce building east and west, more or less Irish Chinese, more or less, makes that thing happen. And examining the racial and immigrant qualities of the vision of railroading across America is a great topic to put right up against abolition, the rise of antebellum sensitivity towards pro and anti-slavery, and these immigrant groups who are hooked by virtue of very difficult and often coercive employ, often fairly well paid employ, to be honest, but difficult, often exceedingly dangerous employ in a race. And you can get students, you can game the railroad with students, particularly at the lower levels. How fast can you build that thing? Because after all, one railroad company is building west, one railroad company is building east. The faster they build, the more federal largesse they get in land and federal cheap loans. So they're, ra they're racing. They're literally racing, which leads to, you can ask your students, if you, if you build a railroad track in a real hurry, isn't that going to cause some problems in capital upkeep and danger, et cetera? And you don't, you've never done this before? And the answer is yes. So they're always falling off the tracks. They're, they smash into each other. People walk in front of them, et cetera. But the challenge as a landscape are legion. The other thing you can do with students is we think of, by virtue of kind of textbook shorthand, we think of the railroad as uh, Northwest passaging the continent and establishing connections east and west. That's true. But we think of it as kind of case closed, job done, the twain has been met. Well, a railroad, the 19th century has a long time figuring this out. Should the tracks be this wide, this wide, this wide, this wide? And even the Union and uh, Central Pacific disagree at a certain moment about the gauge of the tracks. Well, that's a problem. If you meet them and the tracks don't meet, the train will fall off. So they have to work that out. But generally, you know how long, wide a railroad track is. It's generally like that. That's a pretty narrow band of dominance on the landscape. That creates what's, what visual scholars and others will call tunnel vision of the landscape. Because of course the photographers and the visual artists go and they paint that. They paint that vista down the tracks. You can own that visually and say this is now the province of uh, the Republic and Native America get out of the way. But that's a pretty narrow hold. In other words, it's a little hard to make that your exclamation point of conquest when there's everything on either side of that track that may constitute either environmental challenges or the challenges of pacification, move, removal, violent conflict with Native America. So giving that kind of vision, that's why, that's also our nostalgic view. If I asked you to come up with a nostalgic view of a railroad, you'd put it in the background of your head, it would toot along quietly alongside the mountains or the river, and it would be this narrow band of vision. Well, environmentally and otherwise, this is a notion you can call into the students about the absent view of nostalgia in the 19th century past. In other words, cutting edge of modernity, technologically sublime. The corporate entity surrounding railroads are the most sophisticated corporate bodies in, American, in 19th century America, with the one possible exception of the Union Army in 1864 or 5, but really sophisticated. But much like they have to accommodate to the speed of these things, they also have to accommodate to their literal just presence on the landscape. 19th century Americans are so proud of the railroad. San Francisco, Oakland in particular is really into this. They will steam a big passenger or freight railroad down the most elite street in the neighborhood. They'll put it right down the middle with gilded age Victorian mansions on either side of it until they figure out there's a right side of the tracks and there's a wrong side of the tracks. At first, they want to show it off. They put it right down that street. Well, railroads are, nostalgia aside, sooty, steamy, smoky, smelly, dangerous, loud. They're really an intrusion on the landscape. That nostalgic thing is, is wishful. The, the Bierstadts and the 19th century uh, grand painters, that's wishful. To stick a little railroad in the background of a painting 
that shows the grandeur of nature and we're kind of there in presence. No way. It kills the, it kills, uh, the kid on the block who runs in front of it. It kills your dog. It kills your livestock. They smash into each other. So the comeuppance that the society has to have that these are not peaceful intrusions in the landscape is hugely important. And the environmental opportunities to talk about that intrusion with your students are vast. Even if you just simply put up a picture, you know, a grand, a grand landscape painting from the 19th century. And you can ask students, is it a good thing, is it a bad thing? The level of railroad scholarship now among scholars of the American West and the American technology and American history uh, more generally is really deep and sophisticated. And the questions about good, bad, triumphal, not, successful, needed, unnecessary. The, the master text these days is Richard White from Stanford's book Railroaded, which is brilliant. And he, based, he's, he doesn't pull any punches. He said, uh, overbuilt, unnecessary, largely a failure. And those are really powerful arguments against a tradition of a kind of railroad-obsessed American historical profession. OK. Environmentally as well, very important to think with students about what the railroad age portends. And by that, I mean there's many a Californian. And I, it's, it's absolutely appropriate to put California both, obviously, as the terminus of the transcontinental railroad, but as the exclamation point of bringing the nation together and tying California to the rest of it. It's not that everyone's for it. Many a Californian says, we don't want it. We don't, we're doing fine. San Francisco has regional dominance. Economic dominance, political dominance, we're doing fine. We don't need it. They lose. But the portends are really interesting. Many a Californian, remember, it ends in 18, completed in 1869. Atlantic and Pacific are bridged. We built the Northwest Passage. Manifest destiny is triumphant. We did it. And you know, Manifest Destiny is a very difficult historical customer to wrestle with, but it was successful. In other words, that's not, a, that's not to celebrate it. The blood over Manifest Destiny is buckets. But the success of the Manifest Destiny vision, we're going to go all the way across the nation? We're going to claim it all? They did it. The railroad's fundamental to that. The other thing about this is we've now, we've now um, reunited the country. Think of the railroad as a stitch. It's this wide. It's really long, but it's a stitch. It stitches together the gaping wound of north and south and terminates in the west, where the Civil War will be escaped from. And there'll be a redemptive quality to the railroad age in California. And the hurly-burly of the gold rush, you know, which it's perfectly OK to talk to students about what, it, what amounts to a kind of giant outdoor frat party in the gold hills of the gold rush period, you know, boisterous, male-centric, difficult, violent time to wrench treasure from the earth and push around anybody who gets in your way. The railroad is seen as the apex of the civilizing impulse. We'll now move to the next age. And the most religious among them, will stand in front of their flocks in church and say, turn to your Old Testaments. Find the biblical passage in your Old Testament that says, make straight in the desert a highway for your God. We did it. We made straight in the desert a highway for our God. It's the Central Pacific Railroad. Jesus Christ is coming back, and he's going to ride the railroad. <laughs> 